This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. Many places around the world are known for their iconic structures. The Eiffel Tower in Paris, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, and the Empire State Building in Manhattan are three such well-known landmarks. London, England has more than a few famous landmarks, including the London Eye, Big Ben, and Buckingham Palace. But one of the oldest in that fair city is the Tower of London. Thousands of years of history are contained within its walls. First built as a fortress and a royal palace, it has been the scene of the rise and fall of monarchs, a center of power and politics, and has played host to scandal, intrigue, and even murder. On this episode, I will share with you some of the bloodiest stories in the history of the Tower and the famous hauntings that have followed. This is Chapter 2 of Haunted Homicide. Join me on a journey through the haunted Tower of London. The Tower of London was birthed in blood. The Battle of Hastings in 1066 brought Anglo-Saxon England to an end when during a particularly bloody battle, Duke William of Normandy ordered his troops to shoot over the shield wall of King Harold's elite guard. One arrow landed squarely and spectacularly in King Harold's eye. He fell, and while his troops fought valiantly, by the end of the battle, not only was King Harold dead, but his body was so brutalized that as his people arrived to collect his body, even his mistress had trouble recognizing him. On Christmas Day, 1066, William I became England's new king. But the citizens opposed this Norman king, and rebellions arose throughout the kingdom. King William had castles built along his route into London, fortresses to keep himself and his troops safe from enemies. Great castles were built quickly at Dover, Exeter, York, Nottingham, Durham, Lincoln, Cambridge, and Colchester. But William knew that he needed his most grand and secure castle built in the new capital, London. And he planned to build this structure on the site of the former Roman fort of Arx Palatina, located on the north bank of the River Thames. His new subjects had protested violently at his coronation, so William knew that a show of force had to accompany his new leadership to keep rebellions in check. The new castle in the center of the city was built not only for protection, but also to intimidate. Ten years after his coronation, ground was broken on the new castle. The former Roman-built city wall was used as a temporary barrier on two sides, and a deep ditch was constructed on the remaining two. In the middle, a tower was built, first constructed with wood, but within a decade, replaced by permanent stone. By 1078, William handpicked the master architect, Gundolf, to design the most magnificent castle ever built. It was to be the most militarily sound, as well as an opulent royal residence. The grandest portion was called the White Tower, named for the blocks of pale marble stone from which it was constructed. It rose 90 feet, or 27 and a half meters in the air, had walls that were 15 feet thick, or 4 and a half meters at the base, tapering up to 11 feet at the top. The basement was originally constructed to store food, drink, and armor, but later would be used as a torture chamber, as the thick earth and stone walls served perfectly as soundproofing to contain screams of agony. The second floor of the White Tower was used by the constable to house important guests and later to imprison people of particularly high rank. The structure would be used as a prison beginning in the year 1100 and up until 1952, with its last prisoners being the infamous Cray twins. But still, the tower's principal use was as a royal residence. Expansions to the Tower of London were ongoing, with several more towers and buildings added through the reigns of multiple monarchs. While the Tower of London is now mostly recognized as the home of the crown jewels on display today in the Martin Tower, it has also served several other functions, as an armory, a treasury, a public records office, and as home to the royal mint. It has even served as a menagerie. During the long reign of King Henry III, the tower was greatly expanded, 
no expense was spared to renovate the royal palace, which included the building of luxurious private quarters for the king and his French queen, Eleanor. The original Roman city wall on the eastern border was demolished and replaced by a tall curtain wall flanked by three new towers, the Lanthorn Tower and the Salt Tower, and the largest tower after the White Tower, the octagonal Wakefield Tower. During Henry's reign, the first wedding was held at the Tower of London, his marriage at age 29, to the 14-year-old Ellen of Provence. Henry founded his royal menagerie in 1235, when his new brother-in-law gifted him three leopards after his sister Isabella married Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. Later that same year, a lion was added to the menagerie. Now with four big cats in his collection, Henry III decided to move all the animals in Henry I's menagerie at Woodstock to the tower. It's believed that this collection may have included more lions and leopards, as well as lynxes and a camel. The first recorded tourists to the tower were the special visitors that were invited to come and view these animals. Over the years, other exotic animals were housed in the menagerie, including a polar bear sent by the King of Norway. The bear was allowed to fish for salmon straight out of the River Thames. An elephant became the most celebrated animal of the menagerie when it arrived in 1255. Sadly, but not surprisingly, many of these animals did not survive long. When the elephant died, the enormous house that had been built for it was later used to hold prisoners. The menagerie itself remained open until 1835 and became a popular destination for people who would pay to view the exotic animals. It was finally closed after a series of dangerous animal escapes and attacks, including the near-fatal mauling of a zookeeper by a leopard in 1830, a timber wolf escape in 1834, and a monkey's attack on a guardsman in 1835. But I digress. I found it so odd that the infamous Tower of London once held a public zoo that I had to share a little bit of that history with you. But not to worry, I won't prattle on through the 950-year history of the Tower of London. I am not Dan Carlin, and this is not hardcore history. Although, that is a most excellent podcast. No, dear listener, let's get back to what you've tuned into this series for, The Murders and the Hauntings, right after this quick word from our sponsors. Producing a weekly podcast takes all my time. Don't get me wrong, I love it, and would do it 24-7 if I didn't need to sleep, or eat. And that's sometimes a problem. I sometimes get so busy that I don't take time to prepare a healthy meal. And when that happens, I might end up grabbing something that's not so good for me. That's why I'm super excited about our new sponsor, Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest delivers perfectly portioned cups of meals made up of frozen organic fruits and vegetables directly to my door. I don't have to go anywhere to get the healthy fuel I need, and it's fast and convenient to make and eat. Daily Harvest started two years ago with their delicious smoothies, but now they are so much more. In addition to their plant-based ready-to-blend protein smoothies, they now have soups, harvest bowls, lattes, and more. All you have to do is add water or your favorite milk to your cup, then just blend or heat for a delicious ready-to-go portable meal. Just this week, I had the cauliflower and rice harvest bowl for dinner and a mango and papaya smoothie for breakfast. I was so excited about how easy it was to prepare and the flavors are fantastic. There are so many more to choose from, I don't know how I'm going to pick. But that's okay, because their subscription plan is super flexible too. You can choose any combination of their delicious superfoods, which are shipped to you weekly or monthly, your choice, and you can skip or pause your plan as needed. Go to daily-harvest.com and enter promo code ONCE to get three free cups in your first box. That's promo code ONCE for three free Daily Harvest cups at daily-harvest.com. Once again, daily-harvest.com. Le Mystere designs beautiful lingerie that looks stylish and feels amazing. Finally, you don't have to sacrifice sexy for fit. You can have both. Le Mystere provides bras that look good, feel comfortable, and most importantly, fit great. Their bras come in a variety of styles and sizes from A to H and have earned a celebrity following. Oprah even featured Le Mystere bras on her list of favorite things. What I love is that Le Mystere works to make sure you get your perfect fitting bra, something that's long been a mystery to most women. Their website gives you great tips on finding your true and correct fit, 
but they also offer certified bra fitting experts who will personally work with you. Lay Mystere is sold at fine retailers like Bloomingdale's and Saks Fifth Avenue, but you can also schedule a Skype fitting on their website, laymystere.com. Plus, 50 of our listeners will receive a free Lay Mystere cosmetic bag with their purchase. Go to laymystere.com slash gift. Add the cosmetic bag to your cart, add your other purchases, and then use promo code ONCE to knock the price of the bag to zero. That's L-E-M-Y-S-T-E-R-E dot com slash gift. And use promo code ONCE. The first ghost reportedly seen at the Tower of London was that of Thomas Beckett, Archbishop of Canterbury. His apparition was observed by workers who were in the process of building the inner circle wall of the tower in 1241. The wall had been commissioned by Henry III, the grandson of the king, who is said to be responsible for Beckett's murder in 1170. Thomas Beckett was the son of a wealthy English merchant who was educated in Paris. While he was away at school, his family's fortune was lost, and he was required to find employment. He first worked as a clerk, but his well-bred social graces and education helped him to secure a position in the household of Theobald of Beck, who was then serving as the Archbishop of Canterbury. Beckett impressed the Archbishop, who then sent him to Paris to study law. He was dispatched by Theobald on important missions to Rome and also to Bologna to study canon law. When he returned to England in 1154, Theobald appointed him Archdeacon of Canterbury. The following year, Theobald introduced Becket to the newly crowned Henry II. They instantly took a liking to one another, and before long, Henry considered Becket a trusted friend and advisor. In January 1155, King Henry appointed him as Lord Chancellor. As Chancellor, Becket's primary role was to enforce tax collection of all revenue of the kingdom's landowners, including the church. Becket was so well trusted by King Henry that he sent his son to live in Becket's household, since the custom at that time was for noble children to be fostered by other noble families. Archbishop Theobald died in 1161, and King Henry selected Becket to become the new Archbishop of Canterbury, the highest ecclesiastical position in the land. Henry trusted Becket completely and believed that their bond would ensure that the new archbishop would side with him on matters of contention between his government and the church. But although Becket had little religious training, only being vested as a priest a day before he was made archbishop, he now fully embraced his role as a cleric and shifted his allegiance from the court to the church. One of Henry's first requests of the new archbishop was to side with him on eliminating the custom of religious courts meeting out justice to their clerics. The public wanted a murderer who'd been acquitted by the religious court brought before the king. Becket intervened against the king's wishes. This angered Henry, who summoned Becket to his court at Northampton to answer charges. The king now asked his former chancellor what he had done with the large sums of money that he'd collected. Henry accused him of malfeasance in his role as chancellor as well as contempt of royal authority. Becket stormed out of the trial and beat a hasty retreat out of town. He remained in exile in France for six years. King Henry continued to issue edicts against Becket, but the archbishop was offered protection by King Louis VII of France. Finally, in 1170, Pope Alexander III intervened to propose a solution, and Henry agreed to a compromise that would allow Becket to return to England. But while in France... Becket had taken the step of excommunicating the bishops of London and Salisbury for their support of the king. When he returned to England, it was assumed by Henry that he would absolve them. However, the archbishop refused. When word of this reached Henry, who was still in France, it is said that he flew into a rage, shouting, What sluggards, what cowards have I brought up in my court who care nothing for their allegiance to their lord? Who will rid me of this meddlesome priest? Other versions cited are, Will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? And perhaps my favorite for its sheer poetry, What miserable drones and traitors have I nourished and brought up in my household, who let their lord be treated with such shameful contempt by a low-born cleric? While the exact words of this utterance are debated, the sentiment remains. Whether or not King Henry literally wanted the archbishop taken care of is unknown, 
But what is known is that four knights who are present as the king voiced his frustration took it upon themselves to sail to England to confront the archbishop. The knights arrived in Canterbury on December 29, 1170. A monk who wrote an account of the events reported that, before entering the cathedral, they left their weapons and armor outside under a tree. They then entered and demanded that Becket come with them to Winchester to give an account of his actions. Ever stubborn, Becket refused to go with them and sent them away. They retrieved their swords and re-entered the cathedral, where they found the archbishop joining the other monks who were chanting vespers. They caught up to him as he was kneeling at the altar. One account of what transpired next was written by Edward Grimm, who was wounded in the attack by the knights on Becket. He writes, The wicked knight leapt suddenly upon him, cutting off the top of the crown, which the unction of sacred chrism had dedicated to God. Next, he received a second blow on the head, but still he stood firm and immovable. At the third blow, he fell on his knees and elbows, offering himself a living sacrifice, and saying in a low voice, For the name of Jesus and the protection of the church, I am ready to embrace death. But the third knight inflicted a terrible wound as he lay prostrate. By this stroke, the crown of his head was separated from the head in such a way that the blood, white with the brain, and the brain no less red from the blood, dyed the floor of the cathedral. The same clerk who had entered with the knights placed his foot on the neck of the holy priest and precious martyr, and, horrible to relate, scattered the brains and blood about the pavements, crying to others, Let us away, knights, this fellow will arise no more. The king was said to be horrified by the actions of the knights. The public was outraged by this brutal act of murder committed on a holy man in a sacred place of worship. They began to venerate the archbishop as a martyr. Within two years of his death, he was canonized as a saint by Pope Alexander. The knights who assassinated Becket fled to the north and hid out for about a year. Though Henry declined to have them arrested, all four were excommunicated by the pope. They later traveled to Rome to ask for the pope's forgiveness. Pope Alexander granted their request on the condition that they serve as knights in the Holy Land for a period of 14 years. Four years after Becket's murder, King Henry performed an act of penance by donning a sackcloth and walking barefoot through the streets of Canterbury, where 80 monks flogged him along the way. He then spent the night at Becket's tomb. Canterbury had always been a destination for the faithful because of its religious importance. But after the death of Thomas Becket, pilgrims arrived in even greater numbers. Fifty years after his death, Becket's remains were moved from the original tomb to a shrine in the recently completed Trinity Chapel. In 1538, King Henry VIII enacted the dissolution of the monasteries and ordered the chapel and Becket's bones destroyed. So why was Becket's ghost said to haunt the Tower of London? Well, for one thing, he had one supervised construction at the tower, including the reinforcement of the outer wall. The inner circle wall was added in 1241, and while it was under construction, some workers reported seeing the ghost of Becket on two separate occasions. Both times, he was seen touching the new wall with a cross he held in his hand. As he did so, the wall crumbled. The king at the time of this ghost sighting was King Henry III, who was the grandson of King Henry I, the man said to be responsible for the death of Thomas Becket. The new King Henry was sufficiently superstitious to feel the need to appease the ghost. He had a chapel built in the tower and named it after Becket, after which time, according to legend, the ghost was never seen again. Okay, so this next portion doesn't include a ghost sighting, although it wouldn't be surprising if it did, as this is a particularly brutal tale from the tower. I found it while doing research, and I had to share it with you. I'm sure many of you have seen the movie Braveheart, the 1995 movie starring Mel Gibson as Scottish warrior William Wallace. Wallace led the Scots in the First War of the Scottish Independence against King Edward I of England. Edward I was known as the Great and Terrible King, who ordered the harshest and most gruesome punishments ever seen against his enemies. William Wallace, betrayed by a close friend for a large ransom, was captured and brought to the tower, where he was imprisoned as a traitor. He was quickly tried and found guilty, and his sentence was read into the record as follows. 
you shall be carried from Westminster to the tower, and from the tower to Aldgate, and so through the city to the elms at Smithfield. And for your robberies, homicides, and felonies, you shall be there hanged and drawn, and as an outlaw beheaded. And afterwards, for your burning churches and relics, your heart, liver, lungs, and entrails, from which your wicked thoughts came, shall be burned. And finally, because your sedition, depredations, fire, and homicides were not only against the king, but against the people of England and Scotland, your head shall be placed on London Bridge in sight both of land and water travelers, and your quarters hung on gibbets at Newcastle, Berwick, Stirling, and Perth to the terror of all who pass by. The following account of exactly how the sentence was carried out is described in Nigel Jones's excellent book, Tower, An Epic History of the Tower of London, which I highly recommend. I'm going to read his account, because I don't think I could write it better than he has already done. Warning, it's extremely violent and brutal. But this is what constituted justice in the 13th century. First he was bound to a hurdle fixed to a horse's tail, with his head dangling humiliatingly near the ground. Exposed to the jeers, taunts, and filth flung by the braying crowds lining the streets, he made a slow journey to the scaffold, past the stations of the cross decreed in the sentence, Westminster, the Tower, Aldgate, and finally Smithfield, where a high scaffold had been erected, the better for the crowds to enjoy this martyrdom. Wallace was first hanged from a gallows, slowly strangling. As the victim involuntarily urinated, defecated, and ejaculated, the obscene jeering of the mob reached fever pitch. The executioner, a skilled torturer, slashed through the rope just before death supervened, reviving the insensible victim with a bucket of water. Wallace's genitals were then sliced off and flung into a fire to be burned before his dying eyes. Next, a deep incision was cut into the abdominal wall of the agonized but still living man, and his intestines were slowly drawn out and consigned to the flames. Only when the executioner pushed his bloody hands into the chest cavity and ripped out Wallace's still beating heart and lungs did merciful death finally ensue. Even then, though, the butchery was not complete. The corpse was cut into four quarters, each with a limb attached, to be exhibited in the regions where Wallace had dared to rebel. Finally, the patriot's head was hacked off, boiled in salt, and plunged in a preserving pail of pitch before being spiked on London Bridge. Pretty gnarly. Okay, back to the ghost stories right after this last word from our sponsors. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Policy Genius. Did you know that life insurance rates are the lowest they've been in 20 years? I'm sure you know that life insurance is important, but surprisingly, four out of 10 people don't have it. This is often because life insurance can seem to be so confusing, so it's something we often put off for another day. But now you don't have to, because Policy Genius makes it easy to compare life insurance online. In just five minutes, you can compare quotes from the top insurers to find the best policy for you. And comparing quotes can save you money. It's that simple. But Policy Genius doesn't just make life insurance easy. They also compare disability insurance, renter's insurance, even health insurance. If you care about it, they can cover it. If you've been putting off getting life insurance, there's no reason to put it off any longer. It's easy. Just go to policygenius.com, get quotes, and apply in minutes. Do it now. Don't miss out on the current low rates. That's policygenius.com. The easy way to compare and buy life insurance. Warby Parker is a new concept in eyewear and makes buying glasses easy and risk-free. Check this out. Their home try-on program allows you to order five pairs of glasses shipped directly to you where you can try them on in the comfort of your own home. Get feedback from family and friends for five days before sending them back using a free prepaid return shipping label. And there's no upfront cost and no obligation to purchase. Think about it. You can try on several styles of really cool glasses without the awkwardness of standing in the middle of an eyeglass store while a bunch of strangers gawk at you. And Warby Parker eyeglasses are stylish. I love them. I've got three pairs of Warbys, two regular and one pair of prescription sunglasses that I can change out whenever I want a different look. And I can do that because Warby Parker makes their eyeglasses so affordable. They start at just $95, including prescription lenses. Amazing. And if that's not enough to convince you, listen to this. 
For every pair you buy, a pair is distributed to someone in need. How cool is that? You can order your home try-on kit by going to warbyparker.com slash once. You can download the Warby Parker iTunes app. With the app, you can quickly take photos wearing all the frames, stitch it into a video, and share with friends and family who can help you pick your perfect frame. And for you iPhone X users, you can use the app to also try their brand new Find Your Fit feature that will map your face and recommend 12 Warby Parker frames that will suit you best. Super cool. So go to warbyparker.com slash once to get your home try-on kit. It's the easiest way I've ever found to find awesome frames that look and feel great. The last two stories are the most famous ghosts said to haunt the Tower of London, the Princes in the Tower and Anne Boleyn. We'll fast forward a couple hundred years to April 9th, 1483. After a brief illness, King Edward IV died. Edward IV's heir, Edward V, was just 12 years old when he was to take the throne. So, of course, a regent would be appointed for the boy until he reached the age of majority. His uncle Richard, Duke of Gloucester, was appointed as per his brother's wishes. Meanwhile, Edward V's Woodville uncles and half-brothers, the Greys, were discussing how to keep their power and influence at court. They decided to confirm that Richard would be appointed protector of the king and kingdom, but only as the head of the Regency Council, and not as the sole ruler. With this matter settled, they invited the Duke of Northampton to meet up with the boy King Edward V on his way to London. When he reached Northampton, his nephew wasn't there, but had ridden on ahead to Stony Stratford. The Queen's brother, Anthony Woodville, a.k.a. Lord Rivers, along with Richard's nephew Richard Grey, met him and told him of the changes of plans. The next morning, Richard had Grey and Lord Rivers arrested under the charge of treason against the Lord Protector and sent to Pontefract Castle. Richard then traveled on to Stony Stratford to take possession of his nephew, Edward V, and informed the boy that he had thwarted a plot against him. He then escorted Edward to London. Edward was sent to the royal apartments at the Tower of London, which was the customary place for monarchs to be housed in the days leading up to their coronation. Richard then went to Westminster, where the Queen Mother had sought sanctuary with her other children. Richard sent the Archbishop of Canterbury to persuade her that all was well and that he had their best interests at heart. He persuaded her to send her other son, nine-year-old Richard, Duke of York, to him, where he would be protected along with his brother, the soon-to-be King Edward. She agreed. But on June 23rd, there was no longer any doubt that Richard of Gloucester was scheming to take power. The Queen Mother discovered that her brother, Lord Rivers, and her younger son, Richard Grey, had been executed. Richard then began rumors that Edward V and his siblings were not legitimate children of King Edward IV. It was asserted that the king had been pre-contracted to another woman when he'd married Elizabeth Woodville, so their marriage was in effect illegal, and her children were not eligible for the crown. This now left Richard, Duke of Gloucester, the rightful heir to the throne, as King Richard III. These claims were also put before Parliament, and on July 6, Richard was crowned King of England. For the next few weeks, Edward V and his younger brother Richard, the boy princes, were seen playing in the gardens at the Tower of London. Then, they simply disappeared, never to be seen again. Rumors circulated among the people that the princes in the Tower were dead. What actually happened to them is unknown, but history has long suggested that Richard III is most likely responsible for their murder. The long-held belief is that Richard III enlisted Sir James Tyrrell to kill his nephews. Tyrrell, along with two accomplices, Miles Forrest and John Dighton, presented a letter to the governor of the tower that ordered him to provide them with the fortress's keys. That evening, they entered the young prince's bedchamber. While Tyrrell waited outside, Forrest and Dighton smothered the princes in their beds. While Richard's complicity in the disappearance and presumed murder of the princes is legend, some historians now dispute this, saying there is no actual evidence it is true. However, in 1674, workers at the Tower of London dug up a wooden box found under a staircase in the White Tower that contained two small human skeletons. It was immediately assumed that these were the bones of the missing princes. The bones were buried in Westminster Abbey. Recent requests have been made to DNA test the bones to determine if they can be identified 
as Edward V and his brother Richard, but the Abbey authorities have denied these requests. Ghosts of two young boys have been repeatedly seen around the Bloody Tower, so nicknamed because it was long believed to be the site of the prince's murders. The Bloody Tower has been the sighting of several ghostly visitors, including Sir Walter Raleigh. The princes are often seen wandering the halls wearing nightshirts and weeping. Visitors to the tower as young as toddler age, who would not have any knowledge of this historical story, have described seeing sad young boys in funny clothes. A woman on holiday in 2017 was snapping pictures during a tour at the Tower of London and later noticed a figure of a young boy standing behind her, who was not present during the tour. Others have reported hearing the laughter of children when no children were present. Finally, we come to one of the most famous ghosts reportedly seen at many locations in England. In particular, multiple sightings of the Lady in the Tower, Anne Boleyn, have been reported over generations, many by officers on duty at the Tower, which gives them some credibility. But first, Let's find out more about this Queen of England, who won the heart of Henry VIII, only to find herself facing the gallows a short three years after her marriage to the fickle king. Anne Boleyn was born in either 1501 or 1507. The date is debated by historians. And was the daughter of Thomas Boleyn, who was later given the titles of the Earl of Wiltshire and the Earl of Ormond. Her mother was Lady Elizabeth Howard. Anne had two siblings, a sister Mary and a brother George. They were raised at Hever Castle in Kent. Anne's father served King Henry VII as a diplomat and went on many missions for him during his reign. He continued his career under King Henry VIII. Margaret of Austria was charmed by Sir Thomas Boleyn and offered Anne a place in her household when she was only approximately 12 years old. Anne's personality was that of a pleasant, charming, and well-born girl, and she made a good impression in the Netherlands, where Margaret was ruling on behalf of her nephew Charles. But Thomas Boleyn's goal was to secure a position for Anne in Henry VIII's court, and to this end, he was able to secure an invitation for her as an attendant to Henry's sister Mary. She became part of Mary's household in France when she was married to Louis XII in 1514. Anne remained in the French court, first as a lady-in-waiting to Queen Mary, and then to Mary's teenage stepdaughter, Queen Claude. She remained at the French court for seven years, during which time she became fluent in French and studied literature, music, poetry, and religious philosophy. She also became versed in the art of courtly love and gained experience in flirtatious banter, something that would contribute to her undoing later. Anne was far from a great beauty, but she was attractive, with a slim figure, an olive complexion, and dark eyes and hair. She was quick-witted, graceful, and possessed a sharp sense of humor. She was skilled at cards and other games played by court members. She could also converse intelligently on many subjects, while still maintaining a coy femininity. She was a devout Christian and was devoted to the Virgin Mary. Like King Henry VIII, she was intrigued by the new ideas of church reform and read Martin Luther's writings with interest. She and Henry were especially critical of the corruption within the papacy, but still followed traditional Catholic sacraments of prayer, confession, and penance. In 1521, Anne returned to England where her father was negotiating a marriage for her to wed her Irish cousin, James Butler, the ninth Earl of Ormond. The marriage contract would serve to settle a dispute between families as to the title and estates of the earldom and ward off a civil war in Ireland. But soon after Anne returned, Thomas Boleyn decided against the marriage, and it was called off. Anne's sister Mary had wed William Carey, a noble of no great standing. Her wedding celebration was held at Greenwich and was attended by Henry VIII. Henry was attracted to the new bride and soon made her his mistress. Mary had two children during this time, and it has long been debated whether her husband or the king was their father. In either case, Henry did not acknowledge either child, and Mary left court to live in the country with her husband. Anne was presented to the court of Henry VIII in 1522. She, along with several other ladies of the court, took part in an elaborate costume dance that was performed for the king's entertainment. 
her time in France set her apart as more stylish and worldly than the local ladies. She was also a skilled dancer. She became very popular at court and was pursued by many admirers. Anne was courted by and fell in love with Henry Percy, son of the Earl of Northumberland. They became secretly betrothed to one another, but later, when this was revealed, they insisted that the relationship had not been consummated. Percy's father opposed the match, and Anne was sent away to the countryside, while Percy was married off to Lady Mary Talbot, who he'd been promised to in his youth. They had an unhappy marriage, and Mary would later seek a divorce, accusing her husband of having a pre-contract with Anne Boleyn. This would make Henry and Anne's betrothal legally binding, and serve to invalidate her marriage. The pre-contract was never proven, and the couple remained married. But Mary hated her husband, and lived apart from him for most of their marriage. Anne returned to the court to serve as a lady-in-waiting to Queen Catherine. Henry, who always had an eye for the ladies, now set his sights on his former lover's younger sister. In 1526, Henry began his courtship of Anne Boleyn. By this time, he'd been married to Catherine for 17 years, but the union had not produced a son and heir. Their only living child was Princess Mary. Catherine was five years Henry's senior, about 38 years old at the time Anne came to court, and could most likely not bear any more children. Henry was desperate to have a legitimate heir. He had one illegitimate son, whom he claimed, Henry Fitzroy, Duke of Richmond, but in order to secure his kingdom, he needed his queen to give him a son. Anne, being a smart girl, knew the power she held over Henry and was determined not to become another mistress who was used by him and then tossed aside, as her sister Mary had been. She kept the king's interest by keeping him at bay, not allowing him access to her body until she was his queen. But in the meantime, she allowed him to shower her with expensive gifts. He agreed to marry her, believing an annulment of his marriage to Catherine would be granted to him quickly and easily by the church. He was the king, after all. Henry presented a case for the Pope to grant him an annulment. Catherine was married to Henry's brother, Arthur, the Prince of Wales, and heir to the throne, in 1501. Within months of their wedding, they both became ill with the sweating sickness. Catherine recovered, but Arthur died. It was then decided that she would marry Henry VII's second son, Henry, the Duke of York. To facilitate this, the Pope granted a dispensation since canon law forbade a man to marry his brother's widow. Catherine testified that her marriage to Arthur was never consummated, thus making her marriage to Henry permissible. Henry and Catherine married in 1509, soon after he ascended to the throne. He was just short of his 18th birthday. She was 23. Queen Catherine became pregnant seven times during their marriage, but sadly, she miscarried twice and gave birth to two stillborn sons. Two years after her marriage to Henry, she gave birth to a baby boy, and the kingdom celebrated. But he died before he was two months old. The royal couple's daughter Mary was born in 1516 and would be their only surviving child. In 1518, Catherine gave birth to her final child, a girl, but the baby lived only a few hours. Henry, now looking for an excuse to end his marriage with Catherine in order to wed Anne Boleyn, decided that his union was never valid in the eyes of God since he'd married his brother's widow, a clear violation of biblical law. The proof of God's displeasure, he now said, and perhaps believed, was that they had never been blessed with a male heir. Knowing that his queen was particularly devout, he first appealed to her by saying that the marriage must be annulled and suggested she enter a nunnery to live out her days in penance for their sin. She refused, saying that she was the, quote, king's true and legitimate wife, unquote. To her dying day, she would insist that her marriage to Arthur had never been consummated and upheld her claim as the only true wife of Henry and Queen of England. Henry then petitioned the Pope for an annulment, but when Rome was sacked in 1527, Pope Clement VII became a prisoner of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, who just happened to be Catherine's nephew. Henry now put his great matter, as it became known, in the hands of Cardinal Thomas Wolsey. 
Wolsey called a representative of the Pope to England and arranged an ecclesiastical court to decide the matter. He even called both Catherine and Henry to testify. After two months of hearings, Pope Clement had the case returned to Rome, and all hope of the church granting Henry his annulment was lost. Furious at not getting his way, Henry took it out on his longtime trusted advisor, Cardinal Wolsey. He was stripped of his government office, and Henry took possession of his palace, Hampton Court. The king would use the former cardinal's opulent digs, fully furnished with the finest tapestries, hand-carved furniture, and jewel-encrusted dinnerware, I imagine, anyway, to use as his own main London residence. In 1530, Wolsey was accused of treason, but fell ill and died before he could be tried. Henry now broke with the Roman Catholic Church. He rejected papal authority and had Parliament declare him head of the Church of England, initiating the English Reformation. The following year, Catherine was banished from the court and sent to live at the Moore Castle. She would later be moved to Kimbleton Castle. Anne Boleyn moved into the Queen's former rooms at the palace, and in 1532, Henry and Anne were wed in a secret ceremony. Soon after the marriage, Anne became pregnant, and a second wedding was held in London on January 25, 1533. The following May, Thomas Cranmer, the recently appointed Archbishop of Canterbury, convened a special hearing which he presided over, and declared the marriage of Henry and Catherine null and void. A few days later, he ruled that Henry and Anne's marriage was valid and declared Anne the rightful Queen of England. Catherine was stripped of her title of Queen and was now to be known only as the Princess Dowager, her title as the widow of Arthur. Her daughter Mary was declared illegitimate, and any children of Henry and Anne would now be next in line to the throne. On September 7, 1533, Anne gave birth to a daughter, Elizabeth. But now that Henry, who'd waited seven years to wed and bed Anne Boleyn, had what he long fought for, he wasn't entirely pleased. First of all, Anne had yet to provide him with a son. Also, his new bride was much more opinionated and headstrong than he liked in his women. She'd been in her mid-twenties when they'd first met, but now she was in her thirties, and there wasn't much time left before her childbearing years would be over. Anne also felt this pressure, but at first wasn't concerned, believing she would surely give Henry many children. In the meantime, she relished her role as queen. There were clear factions for and against her marriage to Henry while they were embroiled in the great matter, and she hadn't forgotten who had opposed her. She lorded her position as queen over them, and in the process, created more enemies. She even acted haughtily to family members who had worked behind the scenes to help place her in her position as queen. Her own uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, grew to resent her and would become instrumental in her later downfall. Anne became pregnant again quickly, but suffered a miscarriage in 1534. She was pregnant again in 1536, when news came that Catherine of Aragon was dead. Anne expressed her joy, stating, I am indeed queen, and wore yellow to celebrate. Days later, Anne had a shock upon hearing her husband had been badly injured in a jousting fall and was not expected to recover. Henry pulled through, but Anne miscarried a male child five days later, the same day Catherine of Aragon's funeral was being held. Things quickly became dire for Anne. Henry now believed that he was cursed, and he blamed Anne for bewitching him and not making good on her promise to provide him with a male heir. The truth was, he'd grown tired of Anne soon after their marriage. He'd already taken up with young Jane Seymour, a lady-in-waiting to Anne Boleyn. Thomas Cromwell, the king's chief minister, who'd once been an ally of Anne Boleyn's, had turned on her when she influenced the king against his advice and opposed his judicial reforms. Now Cromwell saw his chance to rid himself of Anne's meddling by encouraging Henry's interest in Jane Seymour. Early in their marriage, Henry had asked Cromwell how he might go about annulling his marriage to Anne without having to reinstate Catherine as queen. After Catherine's death, this was no longer an obstacle, and Cromwell began to build a case against Anne to secure her downfall. Rumors about Anne had always circulated among Henry's subjects, many whom remained loyal to Catherine. Anne was rumored to be a witch who'd cast a spell on their king. She was called the king's whore, and the concubine, 
and many other ugly names. She was even rumored to have six fingers on one hand. Cromwell used Anne's unpopularity and added rumors that Anne had betrayed the king with any number of men. She had always had a flirtatious nature and was surrounded by many young men at court. Cromwell just needed one to say he'd slept with the queen. He found an easy dupe in poor Mark Smeaton, a musician who played the lute at court and was a favorite of Anne's. Cromwell invited young Smeaton to dinner at his London home in April of 1536. As soon as he arrived, he was arrested. He was tortured by having a knotted rope wound around his skull, which was then steadily tightened as he was questioned about his inappropriate relationship with the queen. As he continued to deny these charges, the pressure was increased until he was in great agony. His eyes felt as if they would pop out of their sockets. He finally relented and said anything they wanted him to to make the torture stop. He confessed to being the queen's lover, but that wasn't enough for Cromwell. Smeaton was also made to accuse others of fornicating with the king's wife and was fed a list of names. Of course, he said yes to every one. Sir Henry Norris, the king's groom of the stool, Sir Francis Weston, and Sir William Bereton, grooms of the king's privy chamber. Finally, they put before him the name of George Boleyn, Anne's own brother. Smeaton was forced to confess that Anne and her brother had committed incest. On May 1st, King Henry was at Greenwich, watching a tournament with Anne by his side, when Cromwell's report arrived to tell him of Smeaton's confession. Without bidding her goodbye, Henry rode off to have Weston, Bereton, Norris, and Boleyn brought to him to be informed of the charges against them. Afterward, they were all sent to the Martin Tower to await their trial. The following day, May 2, 1536, a delegation led by Cromwell and Anne's own uncle, Thomas Howard, the Duke of Norfolk, arrived at Greenwich and interrupted her and her ladies as they were having supper. Norfolk informed her that she was accused of adultery, which amounted to treason against the king, an offense punishable by death. She protested her innocence, but was quickly placed onto a barge that transported her to the tower. She asked the constable on the way if she was to be sent to the tower's dungeon. He assured her that she was not. As a high-ranking prisoner, she would be detained in the same palace rooms where she had spent the days prior to her coronation. A sad irony. She grew panicked and flung herself to the ground in anguish when she crossed under the arch of the bloody tower. After she'd calmed herself, she wrote to her husband to plead with him for justice. She did not expect mercy. She knew him too well. She expected to die, but asked him not to involve innocent men in her demise. She also asked that he not place blame on her daughter. She begged him not to let, quote, that unworthy stain of a disloyal heart towards your good grace ever cast so foul a blot on me or on the infant princess, your daughter. On May 12th, the four accused men, minus George Boleyn, were transported to Westminster Hall for their trial. Anne and George's own father, Thomas Earl of Wiltshire, presided over the proceedings. Thomas Boleyn's main goal had always been securing power and favor with the king for himself. He used his daughter Anne towards that end, and now that she had fallen out of favor, he was happy to do the king's bidding to stay in his good graces, even if it meant sacrificing his own children. The first trial was a mere formality. The jury handpicked by the king all voted guilty, and all four men were condemned to die on the gallows by beheading. Because of their high-ranking status, Anne and George Boleyn were tried in the tower. Their trial was held in the Great Hall of the White Palace. Their uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, presided. Man, this family. Thomas Boleyn himself had offered to sit on the jury, but was refused. Anne appeared before the judge and jury and calmly protested her innocence. Not only was she accused of adultery, she was also accused of giving poison to Henry Norris to use to kill Queen Catherine. In addition, she was said to have conspired to have Princess Mary and the king's illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, killed as well. She adamantly denied all the charges. Yes, she had danced with her brother, but had never kissed him in the way that they were accusing her, in an incestuous way. But the writing was on the wall, and Anne seemed to know that this was all prearranged, and she would certainly be condemned. She was right. 
proof that the trial was a sham and Anne was always meant to die was that Henry told Jane Seymour on the morning before the trial that Anne would be condemned. She was found guilty and her sentence was announced by her uncle. Quote, Thou hast deserved death, and thy judgment is this, that thou shalt be burned here within the Tower of London on the green, else to have thy head smitten off as the king's pleasure shall be further known. Unquote. The king had already decided that he would offer Anne the option of decapitation over burning at the stake. But there was a catch. She had to agree to state that her marriage to King Henry was invalid. This would give Cranmer grounds to annul their marriage immediately. She, of course, agreed, as she knew that not only would she suffer, but her brother, who was tried and found guilty immediately after her, would as well, as would the four other innocent men, who'd been accused along with them. If you needed more proof that this was all prearranged, Henry had already sent for a French swordsman who would carry out the execution using a two-handed broadsword, ensuring a quick, clean decapitation, rather than the usual method of hacking at the condemned with an axe. The executioner was already on his way. He would not have been able to arrive in time if not summoned prior to Anne's trial. After hearing her sentence, Anne spoke to the court. I think you know well the reason why you have condemned me to be other than that which led you to this judgment. My only sin against the king has been my jealousy and lack of humility. But I am prepared to die. What I regret most deeply is that men who were innocent and loyal to the king must lose their lives because of me. On Wednesday, May 17th, all five of the condemned men were led to the gallows at Tower Hill. They were lined up and beheaded one by one. George Boleyn was executed first. He warned the crowd not to place their, quote, trust in states and kings, but only in God, unquote. Henry Norris spoke out for the queen's innocence before his head fell. Barrington protested his own innocence as his last words. Smeaton, who was the only one to make a confession, as the others weren't subjected to torture and continued to maintain their innocence, simply said, I pray you all pray for me, for I have deserved death. Hearing his last words, Anne was dismayed to discover that he hadn't retracted his confession. From where Anne was being held in the tower to await her execution, she could hear the scaffold being constructed on the tower green. She would not be taken to Tower Hill where the men had met their fate. Her execution was set for the next day, May 18th, but was postponed another day, so she spent another sleepless night listening to the construction of the gallows just outside her window. All that fuss for such a very little neck, she managed to joke. On the morning of her execution, she attended Mass at dawn, received the sacrament, and ate a small breakfast. Her long dark hair was plaited on top of her head and covered with a cap to expose her neck. She was given a purse of 20 pounds by the constable of the tower to tip the executioner. I mean, really. And also to distribute alms to the crowd. As a last statement to her husband, she asked that this message be relayed to him. Commend me to his majesty, and tell him that he hath ever been constant in his career of advancing me. From a private gentlewoman, he made me into a marchioness. From a marchioness to a queen. And now he hath left no higher degree of honor. He gives me my innocence, the crown of martyrdom, as a saint in heaven. Kind of a big F you, right? A thousand spectators stood on the tower green to watch Anne Boleyn die. As she mounted the scaffold, she asked to say a few words to the crowd. Good Christian people, she said. I am come hither to die according to the law, for by the law I am judged to die, and therefore I will speak nothing against it. But I pray God save the king and send him long to reign over you. For a gentler nor a more merciful prince was there never, and to me he was ever a good, a gentle, and sovereign lord. And if any person will meddle of my cause, I require them to judge the best. And thus I take leave of the world and of you all, and I heartily desire you all to pray for me. The executioner, speaking to her in French, knelt to ask her forgiveness, as was customary. He wore no shoes so as to approach her in silence, so she would not anticipate the sword before it fell. 
As it fell, she mouthed a final prayer. And Anne Boleyn, Queen of England for just three years, was no more. Henry VIII wed Jane Seymour 11 days after Anne's execution. The following year, the new queen gave birth to a boy they named Edward. Seymour died less than two weeks after giving Henry the son he so desperately wanted. Edward was frail most of his life and died at the age of 14. He never had the chance to marry and had no heir. He was crowned King Edward VI at the age of nine. Henry's daughter with Catherine of Aragon, Mary, ruled as Queen Mary from 1553 until her death in 1558. She married Philip II of Spain, but they had no children. Anne Boleyn's daughter Elizabeth ruled as Queen Elizabeth I from 1558 to 1603. During her 44 years on the throne, England experienced a period of stability and became a leading Protestant world power for the next three centuries. She ruled alone at a time when women rulers without husbands were viewed as an abomination. She did more than any woman before her to advance women's place in society and later in civil and political life. She never married and had no children. She considered herself married to England and believed her primary role was to serve and lead her country. Her reign is viewed as one of the most successful of any English monarch before or since and her reign is referred to as the Golden Age. She was the final monarch of the Tudor dynasty. As much as Henry VIII wished for, plotted, and planned for a son to succeed him on the throne, it was, ironically, his daughter by Anne Boleyn that became his greatest and most lasting legacy. Anne Boleyn may have accepted her fate with grace born of a queen, but it seems she has not faded away quietly. Her ghost is said to haunt many places throughout England, but the most abundant sightings have been at the place she began her life as a queen and ended as an accused adulteress and traitor, the Tower of London. There have long been sightings of an apparition called alternately the Grey Lady and the White Lady. Both are said to be the spirit of Anne Boleyn. She is sometimes seen without her head, or sometimes there is just a black hole where her face should be. There are also sightings of blue and white lights drifting around the areas of the White Tower, St. Peter's Chapel, and the Martin Tower. These ghostly lights are also attributed to the fallen queen. A ghost barge has been witnessed traveling along the Thames, complete with ghostly oarsmen. Anne Boleyn is being transported once again by barge to the tower on these special outings, it's said. Anne Boleyn's ghost has also been spotted many times near what is now the Queen's house in the tower, which is located at the former lieutenant's lodging. Again, reports are of a headless woman in Tudor dress. The rooms where the Queen awaited her execution in the tower are said to be mysteriously colder than the rest of the building. Tourists today still experience a chill as they walk through these areas and also report a strange perfumed odor that lingers. There have been specific sightings of a spirit over the years. In 1864, a guardsman at the tower saw a white ghostly figure in a doorway of the Queen's house. He called out, who goes there, or some such warning, but it continued to advance on him. He pointed his bayonet at the figure when, to his shock, he realized it was headless. It then walked straight through him. The guardsman fainted in terror. He was found by his commanding officer, and was court-martialed for drunkenness and dereliction of duty. But at his trial, two other guards verified that they had also seen the apparition as they were on lookout at the bloody tower. He was acquitted. In 1933, another soldier claimed to see the ghost of a headless body, which appeared near the bloody tower. It rose out of the ground and floated towards him. The soldier also raised his bayonet to defend himself, but as he struck at it, the figure vanished. These sightings are always seen near the same area of the tower and are considered the most credible by those who study such things for the reason that they have been seen by several people over many years. In 1817, Edward Swift, keeper of the crown jewels at the tower, 
was at supper with his wife, children, and sister-in-law when they saw a cylindrical figure like a glass tube enter the room. The figure seemed to be made up of a rolling, white, cloud-like substance. It passed behind Swift's wife and hovered near her shoulder. She felt as if it had seized her, and she crouched down to escape it as the rest of the terrified party looked on. Swift picked up a chair and swung at it, and the strange apparition disappeared. In 1972, a nine-year-old girl was visiting the Tower of London with her family. As she stood by the area where the scaffold now sits, which, by the way, is not the actual spot of the original scaffold site. That was located north of the White Tower. She was listening to the tour guide recite a list of those who had been beheaded with an axe at the tower. The child, who had no prior knowledge of Anne Boleyn, told her mother correctly that Queen Anne had not been executed by an axe, but by sword. She even knew that the executioner had not worn shoes in order to sneak up on the condemned woman before beheading her. Ghostly lights and a ghostly figure are often seen in the upper windows of the White Tower, the Martin Tower, and the Bloody Tower. Guards and others employed at the tower are well acquainted with the spirit, who, legend has it, is Anne Boleyn. Alison Weir, best-selling author of historical biographies on Henry VIII, Lady Jane Grey, the Princesses in the Tower, and Elizabeth I, and who was an expert on the history of Tudor England, including an appendix in her book, The Lady in the Tower, the fall of Anne Boleyn, detailing the sightings of Boleyn's ghost at the tower and other locations around England. She doesn't say whether she believes these accounts or not, but I gather that she does not. She makes much of the fact that Anne Boleyn's ghost is seen in parts of the tower where she was not held, did not visit previously, or places that were not even constructed before her death. One such place is the Queen's House, where there have been several sightings of her ghost. Weir explains that Anne Boleyn was not held there before her execution, so she states it is unlikely the sightings there are credible. However, in my research, I found records that report Anne did visit the lieutenant's lodging, and it was from there that she wrote the pleading letter to her husband to treat their daughter well. The Queen's house is now located on the former site of the lieutenant's lodging. Also, if Anne's ghost was going to inhabit one place in the tower— wouldn't she pick the queen's house? Just something to think about. That'll do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. This chapter was a little different, and I hope you liked it. I love British history, especially the dark history of the Tudors. If you enjoyed it, let me know, and I might sprinkle one or two episodes about that period now and again. Thanks for indulging me. I'll be back next week with a real Halloween treat we'll go into another haunted, creepy mansion that was inhabited by a serial killer. You won't want to miss it. Thank you to everyone who came out for the San Jose meetup. I hope you had fun hanging out with True Crime listeners and me. I want to thank Michael from True Crime Guys and Yolanda from Not Perfect or Functional for being part of that fun event. Check out Once Upon a Crime's Facebook and Instagram pages for pictures. And if you share some of your own pictures of the event on social media, make sure to tag Once Upon a Crime. I'd love to see them. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Until next time, be good to one another.